Hello, Facebook world, and welcome to the Flea and Tick Facebook Live edition. Now, just before we get started, this is pre-recorded because we wanted to show the studies and some links and some statistics. Now, I do also want to say this. This is a very polarizing topic. Just the preview photo alone that we posted a few days ago has had a million plus views on it already. And some of the comments, people were not happy because, of course, nobody wants to feel bad using Flea and Tick products. These kind of like low-dose pesticide poisons, their job, of course, is to kill these insects, but there are risks involved that you should know about. There are rewards rewards, but there are also risks. With all of the new science that's coming out, no pet parent ever wants to say to themselves, why didn't I know? Why didn't anyone tell me? So take some of this information, put it in your toolbox and use it when you may need it. Because when you know better, you can only do better. Hello, Facebook world. Today we are joined by, of course, my co-host here, Dr. Karen Becker and our guest, Dr. Judy Morgan. Now, we definitely have a polarizing topic to talk about today. I know the FDA has done a report on this talking about uh, neurological events that are currently happening with isozazoline products like flea and tick products. As a pet parent myself, you always want to be able to protect your pet. You know, flea and tick products, nobody wants to see Lyme, nobody wants to see all these issues. But now there's reports from the FDA and we have Dr. Judy Morgan, yeah. who's part of a study that says we may want to rethink this a little bit. So you... And, and a team put together a study. I was reading it now. This is a peer-reviewed study titled Survey of Canine Use and Safety of Isozazoline Parasiticides. Tell me more about the study and what you guys found. The things that I started to see with the influx of these new oral flea and tick preventatives really was upsetting to me. As soon as they came out, we started seeing these problems with seizures and neurologic problems, behavior changes, itching, vomiting, diarrhea, liver disease, death, hemorrhaging. And one of the problems with these drugs is they stay in the body for a long time. I got I to gotta talk here about some of the numbers in your paper. Of the people that use the flea treatment, 66.6% .6 of those people experienced a reaction. Like that in itself is jaw dropping. Now I saw the breakdown, but when I actually went into the paper and looked at it itself, that there was actually deaths involved as well. There's a lot. And that's, uh, and part of that problem is the owners are reporting that their dog died from this chemical. We were seeing at that time, there's many more now, 30,000, 35,000 adverse events reported. The scary thing is probably only 1% of adverse reactions actually get reported. Veterinarians don't report it, partly because they don't have time and partly because, again, they don't say A plus B equals C. And a lot of those reports kind of get shoved under the carpet because they don't get reported to FDA, they get reported to the manufacturer. You know, They don't want to accept responsibility for the problem. Unfortunately, we live in a chemical world. People want easy, wow. Four times a year, I throw this pill down my dog and I don't have to worry about fleas and ticks in my house. I don't have to worry about my dog getting tick-borne disease. Uh, one of the things that is upsetting to me, these oral products do not repel. Most of the topicals do not repel. And so when I question people when I'm doing consultations with them, I one of the first questions, have you ever pulled a tick off your dog? Nope. Then why are you applying products or giving an oral product. They think it's repelling. No, they actually just live in an area where they don't have a tick problem or their dog is inside all the time or it's groomed with a short coat or it doesn't taste good to the fleas and ticks, whatever. I think the biggest issue is people assume that by automatically applying these chemicals that it not only are they preventing any type of, you know, they're not like they're repelling fleas and ticks, but they also have the false belief that tick-borne diseases are not an issue. And that's probably another big light bulb. People think, you know, I'm not even going to bother testing for tick-borne diseases because I'm using topical pesticides. And that's another disconnect. It is. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many animals, because now the heartworm test is combined with tick-borne disease testing. So all these dogs are getting that test quite commonly. And it's amazing how people kind of are shocked 
when one of those tests come back positive and they say, well, I've been applying my topical or giving my oral every month. I've never missed a dose. How could he possibly have Lyme disease or anaplasma or like a Rocky Mountain spotted fever or whatever it is? These drugs do not prevent those things from occurring. If, if they're bitten by a tick, the tick is attached for 24 hours. They, they don't die instantly. They're going to be attached. They're going to have a blood meal. So that's one thing that people really need to understand. Just applying a monthly chemical, the same with heartworm preventative, giving it every month all year round just because somebody said it was a good idea. You may live in an area where you don't even have mosquitoes, where you don't have heartworms. We need to look at each case and each area as an individual. I get that there are extenuating circumstances sometimes, but that does not justify throwing chemicals on our pets every month just because. But unfortunately, uh, the veterinarians are not, I don't think, aware of how dangerous these drugs are. And I think they're not putting two and two together. And when the drug sales rep comes in and says, this is the best thing since sliced bread, your patients will love it. Your clients will love you for it. You're going to make their life so easy. And the veterinarian says, good deal. And it's profitable too. It was very interesting. I was listening to an Anna Webb podcast with Dr. Andrew Prentice over on the other side of the pond in the United Kingdom after this study came out that they were finding all of these pesticides in the rivers and their lakes. And he theorized this, there's no studies on it yet, but the theory in the vet community there, because vets are exposing themselves every single day. They're the mm -hmm. ones that are usually applying these products. And in their cupboards, all over their cupboards, they have all of these insecticides and pesticides filled in their clinics that potentially, he theorized, that it could be a contributing factor to this rise in mental illness that mm -hmm. veterinarians are suffering from. Wow. Actually, let's load up that clip right now and see what Dr. Andrew Prentice had to say. Check this out. There's been a bit of a question mark about vets' exposure to all these products because we work in clinics which are surrounded by this stuff, cupboards full of these things. And I think there's been a question as to whether, you know, there's a huge mental health issue within the veterinary profession. And I think there has been asked as to whether all this chronic exposure to insecticides and pesticides might possibly be an element in that. It's unknown. Well, that's an interesting premise because one of the side effects that we see with these drugs in the pets is behavioral disturbances. Behavior changes is huge. Interestingly, with the topical products that contain these, they have huge warnings on them to wear gloves, wrap up the container, dispose of it appropriately, blah, blah, blah. I look at things and say, look, if I have to wear gloves to handle it, even to give the dog the chew, you're supposed to wear gloves. If I have to wear gloves just to hold the thing, why am I putting it inside my animal's body? Most people don't read those package inserts. Most veterinarians aren't saying, hey, by the way, remember to do this. So I think there's a big, I think there's an educational disconnect when it comes to, to the deep and systemic pervasive side effects of these chemicals. Absolutely. And one of the problems with these orals is what I see most commonly, the owner never sees the package. The veterinarians are handing them to the animals yeah. in the clinic. They are giving them to the animals in the clinic to make sure that they get them down. And the owners don't have the opportunity to ask questions or have any fear or concern because they're not seeing the packaging a lot of times. Hey, folks, I just want to chime in quickly here and say this. Look, we know that because of geographical locations, there are some hot spots where there's really bad transmittable diseases. And sometimes you're forced to have to use these chemicals, maybe intermittently. So if you're using these pesticides, we're going to drop a link here where you can get this free PDF resource that Dr. Karen Becker has for you. It's a pesticide elimination PDF. There's a whole bunch of study links and resources as to why Dr. Becker is using the things that she is. And of course, the entire goal of this PDF is to help you minimize the potential side effects when you're forced to have to use flea and chemicals. Hope it helps. Dr. Judy Morgan, Dr. Karen Becker, to all the pet parents out there watching, look, I really hope this information inspires you to do a little bit more research. Think twice before maybe putting some of these pesticides and insecticides on your pet. And as always, we'll see you again. Have an awesome week.